of a deluge of anti-LGBTQ hate speech this Pride Month, uh, growing effort spearheaded by people like Matt Walsh, JK Rowling, Tim Pool, and more. A lot of people have been rightfully concerned about the safety and threats of violence against trans and queer people. Understandable, as conservatives' first impulses after a trans woman on a beer can was to shoot things. Fuck Bud Light and fuck Anheuser-Busch. And after adult underwear, uh, was to throw a fit in the target. This is such bullshit. LGBTQ designed sandals for your kids to wear. But there were a few other troubling tea leaves too. One I saw was of a transphobic hate preacher, Jason Graber who was recorded reading a sermon saying all gay people and trans people should be rounded up by the government and murdered for the good of society. Uh, have, a, have a transgender surgery done on them? Any parent that would do that, they just need to be shot in the back of the head. Right. And then we can string them up above a bridge. This is what Jason Graber with the Sure Foundation Baptist Church in Spokane says should be done to parents who allow their transgender child to receive gender affirming care. Naturally, this video is met with outcry, but soon forgotten about. It's not a good look for mainstream conservatives to be speaking in favor of executing gays. However, I saw something interesting. You see, this church is based in my town, and thus an idea for a very special pride video was born. I decided to go to church. It would be too easy to just go to a single sermon and point fingers at the doctrine on display. They upload all their sermons, so really anybody can do that. But a congregation isn't just a single pastor, it's a group of people. Make no mistake, this is a hate church. They are incredibly invested in homophobic bigotry. I heard some of the most disgusting calls for violence I've ever seen in person as these people smile to a congregation with children in attendance. But that's not exactly surprising. What was surprising was how closely their rhetoric mirrored the exact same talking points you'd hear on a Daily Wire broadcast. The only difference was they crossed the line into calling for violence, where someone like Matt Walsh will merely walk up to it and back down for fear of being censored. Here's the thing, hate like this, like the kind you find at this church, doesn't just manifest on its own. It's incubated by right-wing culture war ideologues, the same ideologues I mentioned earlier, people like Charlie Kirk, Mark Dice, Tim Pool, Ben Shapiro, and others. This is pretty common knowledge to anyone who pays attention every time a mass shooter manifesto is unveiled and shocker, the 4chan scumbag cites Tim Pool or Lauren Southern. But those same commentators are directly insulated by a lack of accountability, they can claim. When a shooter dies, the manifesto becomes suspect to claims of fraud, hoaxes, false flags, and other right-wing go-tos to deflect why violence keeps coming from right-wingers, but the right-wingers aren't actually responsible. This allows people like Tim Pool and Matt Walsh to just wriggle free of any claims that their rhetoric, which dances just barely around incitement, is actually spreading a culture of fear, hate, and violence. Which brings me back to church. Why would I, a trans queer, willingly go to a church where people blatantly admit they want to kill me? It says so right on the website, by the way, if you're thinking that Pastor Graver's rant was an unhinged one-off, but we'll get to that later. It's because I wanted to look these people dead in the eye on their home turf where they were most comfortable and see just how much of what they say comes from the Bible versus the right-wing political commentary they consume. So to really dig into what these people believe and where they get it from, I spent a month attending services, joining church potlucks, sharing my stories and hearing their own. I got a pretty clear look at how much of their open calls for violence mirror the rhetoric of right-wing ideologues and even more alarmingly, how their often hypocritical philosophies are misleading their congregation and by extension, the children in attendance. Every content warning will apply, from racism and anti-Semitism to blatant homophobia, slurs, transphobia, sexual assault, murder, descriptions of mutilation and dismemberment. And according to this church, all of that is part of God's love. These are the kind of people who claim they're always taken out of context, that they're always smeared by mainstream news media. So let's go inside the church for ourselves and hear what they have to say in their own words. Before we go to service, let's look at who Sure Foundation Baptist is and where it came from. Established as an offshoot of Sure Foundation Baptist Vancouver, which was in turn started by Aaron Thompson after leaving Verity Baptist Church in 2018, 
If Thompson sounds familiar, it's because he had several news stories published about his homophobic remarks. Share Foundation Baptist is part of the NIFB, or New Independent Fundamental Baptist Movement, a loose assortment of evangelical churches that are classified by the Anti-Defamation League Center on Extremism as a hate group. Uh, Share Foundation, more specifically, is also regarded as a hate group in Washington by the Southern Poverty Law Center. They're not shy about their controversial standing either. They state on their website that they believe sodomite should be punished by death. They also say no sodomite or homosexual be allowed to join or attend Sure Foundation Baptist Church. Now, if you're wondering exactly how radical they'd have to be to be noticed like this, uh, we'll get to it. I attended these services and talked with these people extensively. But a good appetizer might be this headline Jason Graver made for denouncing Marjorie Taylor Greene, saying anyone who would support her isn't a real conservative because she should be at home instead of working a job. Yeah, these people are so extreme, they think Marjorie Taylor Greene is moderate. With that setup out of the way, I want to preface something about the arguments these preachers make. This particular church, like many conservatives you'll encounter online, runs on grievances. What I mean is that they have a specific set of issues with society, but not a lot of connective tissue between them, so there's a lot of jumping from one point to another in sermons. Uh, but even within those small points, there's so much to unpack that nobody will have time to fact check it. It's almost like Alec Jones's style of radio, where so much is thrown at you, the audience never has time to actually fact check and see how much of it is outright lies or misinterpreted to fit an agenda. Most of the preachers would do this thing I see online a lot, where conservatives like to use blanket statements on the state of the world. Because one thing maybe happened one time to far right wingers, it's now a staple in society that is taking over and a sign of collapse. A great example of this was the story about cat litter in schools a few years back, uh, which quickly gained traction as an anti-trans talking point when it was reported that the cat litter was for kids identifying as cats. However, this wasn't true. Joe Rogan so, like, spoke about the crazy rumor on his podcast. My friend, his wife, is a school teacher and she works at a school that had to install a litter box in the girl's room because there is a girl who's a furry. 15 days later, he acknowledged he shouldn't have said it. The kitty litter boxes is a weird one. It is weird. It's, like, know, it's more I, like an urban legend. I fed into that. I don't think they actually did it. It doesn't seem that there's any proof that they put a litter box in there. But that's the not stopping why, other I influential was, people from spreading the fake story. It's a whole thing, and you should absolutely go watch Kaylin Conrad's excellent video if you haven't, because if you don't know the history of this school, where this happened at, Oh boy, you're in for a surprise. Either way, the kitty litter classroom is an example that, despite being long debunked, people still spread around. It's a, a modern urban legend, but thrown around as literal fact by conservatives grasping for any argument to show how unhinged from reality the trans movement is. There's a lot more to unpack there, but the nuance isn't the point. They say something vaguely resembling a real life occurrence and robbed of the context, it becomes codified to them as something that actually happened, which you see a lot in these sermons. Now, because I'm recording and exposing some people here, I'll only be referring to pastors by names because they're easily found and are seen in the church's own broadcasts. Everyone else will be given a fake name and no children will be featured on video or referenced by name to protect their anonymity. And speaking of recording, Washington, where I reside, is a two-party consent state for recording. However, this does not apply to public gatherings or spaces where there's a reasonable assumption that the conversations were not meant to be private such as a church quite literally welcoming people in from outside, while also recording and uploading its own sermons. I asked a lawyer friend, so I'm not worried about breaking the law here. Now, without further ado, let's go to church. So first I had to look the part. I wore this very simple, fairly straight-ish outfit. The only thing I could really do with my hair, however, was putting it in a messy bun. I also kept in my slight jewelry on my ears, but did almost everything I could to hide my tattoos. In retrospect, this isn't my most straight-passing look, but I'll get that down a little later. Most churches theme their sermons depending on time of year, season, that sort of thing, so I had to make sure I absolutely didn't miss out on the first one of June. I had no idea what it would be, but I was sure hoping, and when I saw the pamphlet, my hopes were confirmed. The name of the sermon was Why We Should Hate Pride. When I first walked in, I was greeted by almost everyone. Seeing a strapping white man in a plaid shirt and blue jeans, they took turns shaking my hand and welcoming me before I was directed to the front of the church because 
front row is where all the single men sit. It was me and one other guy up there. Okay. Hi. Hi. Oh, how's it going, man? Hi, my name is. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, girl. Now, I grew up in church, Lutheran to be exact. I went to church school, I went to catechism, got confirmed in church the whole nine, so I know quite a bit about the ins and outs, but Lutherans are known for our proud traditions. Traditions like too much cheese in the pot like casserole, uh, and singing loudly in an effort to compete with a slightly off-tune organ. But at least there's an organ. While there was a piano, I quickly realized nobody was there to play it. So all hymns would be sung a cappella. Yeah, probably one of the most unsettling things about this church is how they just raw dog the hymns. Just get right in there and, and really, really give it to that music. But nothing is more suspicious than someone who comes to church and doesn't sing. So I really had to give myself to this role. Your armor on, stand firm, everyone. Rest your cause upon his holy word. Rouse them, soldiers, rally round the banner. Ready, steady, pass the word along. I was in two choirs throughout high school, by the way, and competed in both regional and nationally ranked competitions. After a bit of preamble, some reading and more singing, the sermon finally started. Daniel Kutsar, the evangelist of the church, takes the stage and immediately clarifies that we shouldn't call it Pride Month, but Reprobate Month. Yeah, a second title could be why we should hate Reprobate Pride Month, you know, because that, that's what it is. You know, th this month, unless you've been living on a rock, you, you, we know that, you know, our government has decided to celebrate, you know, the, the most wicked people in our society to basically celebrate the entire month. There's a lot to break down here, but it all goes by so fast, I can't even take it point by point. So I'm going to give the highlights and speak on the big ones. I do want to reiterate that from this point, this isn't just your bargain bin Facebook homophobia and transphobia. This isn't daily wire broadcasters making allusions to violence. This is a man smiling and laughing as he describes the violence he wants to happen to others, to a room of families and small children. Day 13, it says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy in the evil way, and the froward mouth, mouth do I hate. So here we see, you know, a, you know, we have here a lot of, you know, hate, you know. It says, hey, if you fear God, if you have the fear of the Lord, that means you hate evil. You know, and the thing about it is that Pride, Pride Month, you know, it celebrates evil. It's all about wickedness. It's all about evil. It's all about defiling children. You know, even, you know, just looking at them, looking at these people, you know, defiles you. You know, that's why, you know, whenever, whenever I see these people, I just look away. I don't want to look at them. Why? Because they're defiling my eyes. And, you know, and that, that's evil for them to just, you know, be undressed like that, dressed in such ways. There's a lot of jumping around to Bible verses, both Old and New Testament, as evidence that LGBTQ people are evil or of Satan. The problem I have with this is that very few of these verses logically follow. For example, this is a verse about pride, but Pride Month isn't the same kind of pride as it's describing. It's actually more similar to the pride many Christians might have in their own faith, something that can be more akin to confidence or belief rather than the arrogance described here. What, what does it mean to hate evil? The first thing on this list is pride, you know, which shows that being proud is evil. You know, and what's interesting about this, uh, these people is they call it Pride Month. You know, why? Because it's an evil month. Because they are evil people and that's why they call it Pride Month. They're the preacher then describes how vile, evil, and disgusting pride displays are, and how much people revel in the wickedness. However, I did go to pride, and even at the late night gay bar after party I went to, everybody still had their clothes on. In fact, there was a comic con the same day as the pride parade I went to, and there was more wickedness on display from the cosplayers there and the anime booths. Mostly the anime booths, actually. He then does bring up a distinction between pride, when what he means with Pride Month, but then just retrofits it to work with the preconceived notions of gay people. This is a lot of the sermon, by the way. Across all the preachers I saw, the sermons are made up of points strung together by Bible verses that are crammed or taken out of context to fit their worldview. Just something to keep in mind if you find anything confusing. Now, basically, they are, and ever since they came out of the closet, now instead of being ashamed of what they're doing, they are all proud of it. So now we've talked about pride and the opposite being humility uh, as espoused by these Christians. But let's talk more about gay people for a second. That's evil. And, and when you think about it, why is it that these homosexuals, like, they target kids, you know, with the, uh, what is it called, that, the queer, 
drag queen. Yeah, why is it that they're trying to dress as filthy as possible and just go to the libraries and just read these, these filthy books to children? Why? Because they want to pervert kids. That's how they, they, they cannot reproduce, so they recruit kids that way. And then if they can get away with, with, away with it, they will molest kids. So in 35 seconds, he claims that Drag Queen Story Hour is to recruit children to be gay. Uh, that they're showing kids explicit material, and that once kids go to a drag queen story hour, they're going to be molested. And it takes so much longer than I have to dig into each of those points individually, but I do encourage you to research them in your own way or watch some videos I've linked down below, including a great video recently released by Some More News. Prefaced with that, this is the exact same kind of anti-drag queen rhetoric we've seen explode in the last few years, primarily from commentators like Matt Walsh, Ben Shapiro, Candace Owens, and Tim Pool. There is video evidence of children being harmed at drag shows. Every single child who's ever attended one has been harmed. They are all abuse victims. Hmm. It says the ultimate family-friendly pride experience. Oh. It's, well, it's not factually incorrect, I get it, but it's no, also it's sexual crying. abuse yes. of children. It's the hysteria they spread, regurgitated and stated as fact to people who will believe what's said on the pulpit uncritically. This is the same right-wing crusade with no meaningful proof, no witnesses and no evidence, but a lot of rhetoric that calls people to possible violence. You know, if you don't believe me, I'll show you that they email us, they write comments on our YouTube account, you know, they talk about wanting to rape my kids and, and rape all of us and kill all of us, and just they go into detail. And it's really, it's really uh, crazy that they just are so, uh, they're just so blunt and they have, they, they're just so bold, did you, to be that vile. The pastor then talks about how the church has received threats of violence and rape against them and their children on Facebook. However, when I looked, I didn't find anything, mostly just condemnations of their brand of Christianity and even a few prayers. Not saying it didn't happen, but I find it definitely suspect that they claim it's easy to find, but it's not. After more anti-gay scripture, we get to talking about the poor. This church has a real problem with homelessness of any stripe. Uh, we get to it more later, but they see them as less than human, as lazy addicts who aren't worthy of sympathy because of verses like this, where Ezekiel is talking about how lazy people have become. But then somehow they twist that to be about gay people, too. Uh, having pride, having plenty of food, having a lot of free time. Now let's see the, the fourth thing on this, on this list says, neither did, the strength, ne neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. So, that, so it's saying that, that the Israelites, or in this case the Sodomites, did not care about the poor and needy. They instead took advantage of the poor and needy. And that's something that a, 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 lot, of, you know, a lot of homosexuals do. They, they like to take advantage of little children. They like to take advantage of women, of poor people. So just keep up. We had a verse mentioning Sodom. So now that everything the verses following are talking about, which pertains to Jerusalem hundreds of years after Sodom and Gomorrah, automatically applies to gay people even though that was far from the only sin Sodom committed. So, according to the pastor, when the Bible says, referring to Israel, quote, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, it is actually talking about gay people taking children, not the people of the city refusing to help those who needed it most, which is a pretty good nutshell of how they use the Bible to meet their ideological agenda in this church. After a little while, Daniel starts talking about why the F slur for gay people isn't in the Bible, but the concept is. And you know what? I'm just going to let this clip play. I'm going to bleep the slurs, but I think this part really needs to be seen in its entirety. Content warning. And you know, the word f simply means a bundle of sticks. You know, basically a bundle of sticks that are meant to be burned. And, and today, if you go visit Brit Britain or Germany or other countries in the Bible, when they ask for a pack of cigarettes, they say, hey, can you give me a fat you know? Or if they're asking for one cigarette, they say, hey, give me that fat you know? So basically, that's, that's what they say. That's part of their language. And, and in America, you know, the word fat has the same purpose. And basically, the purpose of a fat is for the fat to be burned and smoked. I can't properly convey how surreal it was as a trans person to sit and watch someone talk about people like me being burned as he smiled to a room of nodding heads and children who had no idea the hatred they were being taught. To say nothing of the fact that homosexuality wasn't the only sin committed by Sodom and Gomorrah, there are plenty others, uh, including inhospitality and cruelty, which are mentioned. Something to keep in mind as you hear these other sermons. It's stupid. It means, you know, retarded, you know, you can use that word. You know, so it's saying that the homosexuals, they're stupid animals. 
That's what Jude is saying, you know, today. You know, in, in the Old Testament, it compares sodomites to dogs. And the reason why is because dogs, they're gonna hump anything. If you allow, if you allow a dog to do whatever it wants, it's gonna hump every other dog, it's gonna hump you. <laughs> and dogs, they will eat anything. They're gonna eat their own crap. They're gonna eat other people's crap. They're gonna lick their other, other dogs' hinder parts. They're gonna drink their own piss. You know, dogs will puke and they're gonna eat their own puke. You know, in order for a dog not to do that, you have to hold it back. You have to stop it. But if you allow a dog to do whatever it wants, that's what, that's what they're going to do. And guess what? Homosexuals are even worse than dogs. So then, what should be done about these people who God is reserving such judgment for? Leviticus 20.13, you know, if a man, if a man lie with mankind, they shall both be put to death. They are an abomination. Their blood shall be upon them. So the Bible flat out says, hey, if a government did the right thing, they would put them to death. This is a famous verse, but what makes it interesting is that the rest of the chapter is specifically talking about laws against incest, which has led many biblical scholars to think that the original intent was to be against a man and a boy, as in pedophilia. But through hundreds of years of interpretations, the change of a simple word from the Hebrew script has had wide-ranging repercussions. There's some fascinating reading on the subject I can recommend, but for the purposes of this sermon, I don't really care. Besides, we need to talk about the slippery slope fallacy, uh, something that's become incredibly common as conservatives have shifted from being against trans people to LGBTQ people as a whole. Like, you know, it used to be that they just wanted to get married, you know? It used to be, the, it used to be hey, let them do whatever they want, you know, in their bedroom, you know, who cares, it's their business. But now, but then later on, it's like, oh, we want to get married, you know? And now, they, and, and now they want, you know, in, in Washington, they basically pass a law where if a child runs away from home, like six years old and up, if a child right, runs away from home, the government, the, the Washington state is going to take that six-year-old, and if that six-year-old wants to be transitioned into the opposite sex, like if a boy wants to turn, turn into a girl, the state will pay to mutilate his balls off, you know? You know, the, the state will pay to, you know, to mutilate a, a girl and transition into a boy. It's like, this is what they want to do. And this is, this is this year that the Washington state wants to do. These are just lies, regurgitated, disproven talking points that get spouted by people like Alex Jones. And when the people who hear them don't like to look into them, they get preached like this to even more people who won't look into them. The law mentioned uh, has nothing to do with gender surgeries. Instead, it's for minors whose parents have kicked them out so they can have living accommodations. This is an effort to prevent trans and queer kids from turning to drugs and prostitution, which is common in gay communities because of people like this church. When said minors are seeking shelter, they'll also be allowed to have protected care such as HRT and abortions. Nobody is being abducted and given advanced gender reassignment surgery, and there's no evidence it has ever happened as part of this program. Links down below. At this point, we're completely off the Bible. One thing these preachers have in common is going off on tangents, but each one is virtually identical to any alt-right YouTuber who preaches to an audience of already converted conservatives. They jump from one point to another, never providing evidence because everything they're saying is so self-evident to those that already believe. In turn, it just draws them deeper into conspiracies like this one. The, uh, the Washington government's illegal human trafficking, trafficking business where they're gonna take a child in they're gonna mutilate that child, and then when the parents call in, they're like, "Hey, I have a missing child." The Washington government say, "Hey, we don't know where he is." You know, do you think do you think 30 days are gonna be enough for sodomites for homosexuals? No, they're gonna pu push for 60 days. You know, they're gonna hey until they get 360 day recognition, they're not gonna stop until they can molest anybody they want, until they can mutilate anyone they want. They are not gonna stop. They're gonna continue pushing more and more. By this point, I was tired. I felt like I was watching any number of videos from Charlie Kirk or Nick Fuentes or Steven Crowder, but somehow the worst was yet to come. The only time I'm disgusted by the rainbow is, is it's when it's printed. <laughs> it's when I see it, I, you know, the human made rainbows, the one on paper. By the way, uh, this was the pamphlet for that day. So. But let's get to the part that we've all been waiting for, actually visualizing murdering people like me. You know, I'm never going to kill a homosexual unless, you know, unless he's trying to hurt me or my family. Okay, so they don't actually want anyone to die, but they're just talking in self-defense of hypotheticals. It's a little extreme, but it's not really that much of a violent fan. God does not call us Christians to go kill anyone. Right. Yeah, that is the government's job. Yep. You know, and, and, and I'm going to preach what the Bible says. The Bible says, hey, that the government, a righteous government, is going to round up every single homosexual and just shoot them in the back of the head. In the beginning, I mentioned how similar these people's rhetoric is to modern conservative commentators, and you can hear it. 
all the way up to saying the government should round up gay people. This entire sermon has been filled with the exact same talking points you see from Daily Wire on the regular. The, uh, quote, drag child is handed over to the drag mom to be groomed and conditioned. It seems to be essentially a sort of pedophilic, predatory farm system that the groomers have set up. As his mother allowed his sexual parts to be mutilated because he can't feel anything. He'll never know what physical desire for the rest of his life. He'll never know what that means. He'll never have a normal relationship. And that was a decision that was made for him in his childhood. Yes, alongside a host of predatory doctors and therapists, we should all be imprisoned, by the way. There is a fundamental distinction between woman and man. And what that means is that mothers and fathers are both necessary. And so the idea that two men can simply supplant a man and a woman on a generic average level, well, I don't also, think I is true. The thing is, here they're comfortable saying the quiet part loud. Where all the lies and mangled factoids of Matt Walsh or Candace Owens usually lead one to draw their own conclusions, allowing them to sidestep any culpability to any violence that may happen due to their incitement. This church just doesn't care. They'll tell you, just like Shapiro, Crowder, Dice, or Rubin, about how America's failing, how groomers and pedophiles are taking over, and how it's against the Christian values this country was founded on. And then they say the solution, that same solution that steps in line with every other conservative talking point. The one that they won't say, because it'll cost them ad dollars. And people might look at what I'm saying and say, well, it's not fair to pin that kind of radical hate on Matt Walsh. To which I'd say, if every problem they present is exactly the same as these radical bloodletting preachers, how do you think their solutions would be any different? Just something to think about as we continue seeing parallels in the rhetoric espoused by these Christians and right-wing culture warriors. Oh, but we're not done yet. The only fix is a bullet. You know, that is the only fix. So, you know, if, if a government official is hearing this, you know, just save yourself billions of dollars and just realize, hey, the best way to fix this problem is just round them up and kill them all. See, by this point, we know what their solution is to queer people. It's our death. You just heard the violent fantasies yourself, but they have to rein it in a bit. I mean, this is church. You can't just command people to go kill. God wants gay people dead, but how can you reconcile that with we shouldn't kill? I'm glad you asked. I say that the, the sodomites, they are full of poison. You know, it, it's kind of interesting that every single news anchor is like a sodomite now. <laughs> you know, it's like, and, and the good ones, like Tucker Carlson, you know, the moment he's talking about truth, the moment he's talking about something right, he gets fired. Let him melt away when he bend of his bow to shoot his arrows. So he's saying that uh, when God bends his bow to shoot these arrows, let them be as cut in pieces. The guy's like, God, God, can you please just take it or just kill him already? Basically, what they're saying is that when we see God killing sodomites, we should be happy. We should be glad when it happens. It says, he shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. So they're like, hey, we should be so happy that we're going to be like, yes, the sodomite died. And he says, you know, there's blood from the sodomites. And we're going to go and wash our blood, and, 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 our feet in the blood of these sodomites. Our reward is when God kills sodomites. That's our reward. Why? Because, you know, the, the sodomites, they're our enemies. And I hate every single sodomite. I hate every single faggot. And you know, before you judge me for saying that, you know, I already admitted that I'm not going to kill them. I'm not going to go hunt them down. But guess what? If they have the opportunity, they will kill me. If they have the opportunity, they're going to rape me. They're going to kill me. So, hey, I'm, I'm not going to shy away from saying, you know, being, being like David, being like Jesus, being, uh, being like a man of God and just say it like it is. Let's, every single time a sodomite dies of AIDS, let's just rejoice. I'm like, yes, another one died. Whenever, you know, let's pray for more, uh, for more Muslims to go and shoot up these, these gay nightclubs. And whenever, you know, 50 of them die, I'm like, yes, less pedophiles on this earth. Yeah. It's really a puzzle to me how they can reconcile all of these ideas, that God is love to all people, but these people should die. That we should praise God if they're killed, but don't do it ourselves. Which, wouldn't you know it, is probably the same question I guess Tyler Dinsmore had when he was arrested in 2022 for threatening openly to attack a pride parade with an automatic rifle on social media. Time a man threatening the Anacortes pride parade happening this weekend. And it all came to a head today. An hours long standoff in Oak Harbor lands the 27 year old behind bars. He's now being held on a $1 million bond. Police found several more offensive posts, including a pair where Dinsmore allegedly wrote, quote, I was nine millimeters away from Fed posting to F word yesterday. I may not make it through this F word month. Dinsmore is also charged with a hate crime, accused of yelling and threatening an Oak Harbor couple he believed to be gay. But for the family, planning Saturday's parade, being visible in times of bigotry is the purpose of pride. See, Tyler 
went to the Vancouver version of this church. He'd only gone to a few sermons and gone soul winning with them, which is a process whereby they go house to house and share these little pamphlets, which uh, strangely don't share any of their more spicy talking points or rhetoric. There's no telling exactly where Tyler got the idea to call gay people groomers and pedophiles, but the rhetoric does sound strikingly familiar. It was easy for the church to distance themselves from this newcomer when he was arrested and media reached out for comment, but that's not the concerning thing. The real concern here should be that someone who has consumed this kind of right-wing propaganda to the point of threatening to kill at real events would go to a church that not only says that gay people should die, but that they would celebrate if it did happen. Reportedly, Tyler was so fervent for this kind of rhetoric, he traveled five hours at a time and slept in nearby parks overnight to attend church services to hear stuff like this. And homophobia wasn't the only thing similar between what he believed and what the church espouses. Here's a full gab post Dinsmore made before being arrested, as reported by the Daily Coast. Quote, I am Tyler, and Jews are responsible for just about every bad thing in this world. They are agents of Satan and deserve severe punishment for their nefarious deeds. They will all go to hell. All homosexuals are child rapists in weight, and all, every single one should be put to death immediately. They will go to hell. Adulterers should be put to death with no exceptions. White people are not responsible for the bad behavior of blacks, and the best case scenario is that we live separately in our own nations. There is nothing more useless than a career woman. It's an abomination. End quote. I know the sermon has been all about the homophobia and transphobia, but we're going to see more direct parallels with the church's own doctrine and Tyler's calls to violence soon. The last half of the sermon is the same blend of non-biblical right-wing hysteria, all about gay people being pedophiles who are changing the laws to abduct your children, and misconstrued Bible verses justifying violence against them. Safe to say, by the end of it, I was pretty tired. It's an exhausting experience, but it was only the start. After the service, the preacher Daniel came up to me and asked if it was too intense. Evan, right? Yes. Hopefully I wasn't too harsh. No, it no, was refreshing. Hey, it's uh, what the Bible says. Yeah, and I yeah. proved it. It's hard well, to find a, church, a lot of uh, people don't know. Yeah. I had accidentally let my real name slip earlier, so I had to improvise a little bit, which was okay because it went well with the backstory I'd cooked up for Evan, an aggrieved young white straight man who grew up in the faith, but whose mother was part of a more accepting church. Conversation was brisk, but then Phil, who I've renamed for anonymity, who had been working the soundboard during service, pulled me aside and asked if I'd been saved. Can we ask you if you die today, are you 100% sure you go to heaven? I will. What do you believe it takes to be saved? Just then gave me the spiel I would later learn was given for soul winning, again, where they go door to door preaching and hand out little flyers, like these. And you know, Jesus can hear you when you, you, when you call upon him and he is waiting for you to ask him for salvation. What I want to do right now is just help you tell that to Jesus that that's what you believe. Mm. And you're basically confessing to him that, hey, you believe on him and you want the free gift of everlasting life and you want to be saved. Yeah. So let's do that right now. All if right. you believe that, I do. amen. So just bow your head, bro, right. and say, dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve hell. I know I deserve hell. But I believe you died on the cross for me. But I believe you died on the cross for me. And rose again to pay for all my sin. And rose again to pay for all my sin. At the end of the conversation, I had been saved. I had accepted Christ's gift of mercy. But I also had to get to work. I shook everyone's hands and quickly left. Any other interactions would need to be left for another day. I also left with a goodie bag uh, for new congregants, which includes DVDs for things like the sodomite deception. See, this church does two different sermons every Sunday, often with two different preachers. One in the morning and one's in the afternoon on similar but still different themes. Due to scheduling, I didn't make it to the afternoon ones, but I wanted to watch them in case there was anything interesting tying to the morning sermons. This Sunday, the second sermon was titled The Worldview in Light of the Bible, and dealt primarily with how the world's view of good is different from the Bible. And while it was very different from the Pride Special, it really filled out a little bit of the rest of this church's primary worldview, particularly as it involves the treatment of women and children. But let's go over it real quick, because a lot of this sermon is just completely self-evidently wrong. I, I don't even need to push back on most of these points. See, the Bible is the default view. It is the moderate view. It is the not extreme view in all things. 
You're like, well, I don't know. Currently, well, there's a lot of things in the Bible that people say are problematic, offensive, troubling, concerning. Not with the times. No. Actually, the world has gone insane. We start off talking about how to correctly interpret the Bible, which is rich considering how the last sermon went and how future sermons would go. Oh, you just say that because you're religious. I don't actually care if you recognize or understand God. If you say there are more than two genders, you are a, either A, a liar, and you're trying to fit in. You're like, I don't want to cause troubles because you're a weak, pathetic person that cannot stand up for truth in any aspect of your life. That makes you an extremist. In the world now, if you're in school, this is what they teach. All people are good. They just have the chance to do bad. Everyone is naturally good, but they have an ability to do bad. That is an insane way to look at the world. This is how people let their children go out and be raped. This is how you let pedophiles to be allowed near nurseries, not just in churches. Understand no country until a few decades ago would allow most people that have a sexual preference towards minors near any children. But if you feel that that's okay or you don't want to be offensive, you are an extremist. You may have noticed that kids are a big focus. At all the services, there were several young children in attendance and you can often hear them in the videos they uploaded and my own recordings. This church follows a strict mandate that you should procreate, and that often accompanies women being in subservient roles, which I will talk about next week for sure. What, do you, what should you do? Get married, have babies, raise them. Try to set them off into life. And raise them up in the way that they will go. That'll be pleasant to the Lord. Okay, well, what else? Okay, if you're a man, get married, work until you die you die. Women, make babies, take care of them, help your kids take care of theirs. You did what you were supposed to do. You're like, but I want to change the world. Your life is meaningless. So what like, well, I'm going to reject anything I have in this life. I'm going to mutilate my body so I can't have kids. And then I'm going to fight so pedophiles can be near kids. Do you you are not going to find meaning and satisfaction in your later life by what you did with your life. And you're like, well, I think everything you believe is a fairy tale. Well, it's amazingly that the fairy tale carries on society and makes people feel peace in this world. And we can live peacefully with neighbors for our entire time that view different than us because we know that they're sinners and that we wish that they just came to our fairy tale. One thing this congregation is for, unsurprisingly, is corporal punishment. There are several points where they at length praise spanking, but also don't really draw any difference between just the light spanking and beating children with rods as depicted in the Bible. I have no reason to believe that they are outright beating their children, but for now, we'll have some talk about how to discipline children. He that spared the rod hated his son, but he that loveth him chased him big times. Hey, that's an extreme view now. Hey, if you look back at what in England in the 1800s, what they did in boarding schools to discipline it, you would look at anyone who spanks now and go, wow, they're really soft. Because they would have everything from students stand naked out in the rain if they didn't listen to their teacher, you know, to fix them and then beat them when they came in. And that was normal, like in the 1800s. Yeah, they talk about how child abuse is good, actually. Uh, saying that boarding schools in the 1800s would have kids stand naked in the rain and then get beatings as if it was a good thing that we should return to. Then we have a very not normal story about ogling a child. Just, I'm, I'm gonna let this one play out, honestly. I went to a poetry reading last night and the first reader, I assume because it's high school students, she is a minor, is in a see-through dress. And I can tell that her um, underwear was polka dot. Like, her mother was in the audience. Now, she may be nice, and maybe she didn't realize how broad it was, but somebody should have let her, like, some parent should have been like, I'm sorry. 
That is not good enough. And they could say, you, you guys won't go too far. You're all in very modest wear. Okay, then, fine. But what I'm saying is, if you are wearing even a mini skirt, but yet I can tell through the clothes what your you know, private underwear looks like, that is beyond not modest. And you're putting her up on stage to read to a public forum in a very pro-happy, inclusive environment of, you know, you know, as we said, those that would have taken their conscience away. And what I'm saying is this, it's like as our society has just allowed, you know, women, because here's the thing, hey, what did I say your job is? Hey, man to work. But here's another thing, is to prepare your kids to follow you. So here's the moderate view. You're raising your kids to be husbands and wives. You don't want you, the future husband that you're sending out in the world to be lazy, to be uneducated, to be women, to be mean, to come with diseases, drunkenness, drug addictions. You want to raise them to be like, hey, I would actually think this person will become a good husband. With your daughters, you're supposed to be raising them and be like, hey, they shouldn't, you know, you dress modestly so it's less likely that they've had so many failed relationships before somebody marries them. Then after that, back to the sexism. They're like, well, they need to discover ourselves. Well, once they discover that, wow, it's kind of miserable being a whore, it's a little late for you to become a great wife. And then to finish it off, we have a fun nod to Pastor Jason Graver's headline-grabbing sermon about hanging LGBTQ people and their allies from bridges. No one was hung from a bridge. And I'll say this, I should have looked it up. And they're like, well, Paul, are, do you stand behind that? I was like, I have to look it up because I don't know if you can leave them up on the bridge. I think by nighttime, like, I need to do a little deeper study. The one thing is, you know, as a warning, I don't know if you can just leave them up there forever. I think, you know, you know feast days, we have to take them down. So, Jason, you might have gone a little far. Ah, <laughs> what a kidder. Now, you'll notice that while he mentions he didn't say it, but they didn't actually do anything. Funny, he didn't mention that someone from a sister church was arrested for threatening to do that exact same thing, but whatever. So coming out of this week, I had a pretty comprehensive look at what this church, or at least these two pastors, believed. Gay people deserved death and suffering was cause for celebration. Women shouldn't strive to do anything but be housebound mothers. Children should be subject to violence more often for correction. And the government should enact reforms and laws directly in keeping with this interpretation of the Bible, which is essentially a call for open fascism. And what was the reaction of the people in attendance? They agreed. They laughed at jokes about hanging gay people and agreed with them being burned alive. The women and children nodded along as they were told that they shouldn't want to be anything but subservient to men. So what could possibly be next? For my second service, I had to step up my clothing game a bit. From the depths of my closet, I pulled out some clothes I had laying around since my time at Macy's working fresh out of high school. And in keeping with the theme of being a single straight white dude, I picked colors that clashed, shoes that weren't appropriate, and didn't iron a single thing I wore. I can't possibly describe how physically uncomfortable this outfit was. Brother Paul, who handled the previous Sunday's supplemental sermon, took the pulpit again today. The air was faint with the aroma of tender spiced meats marinating in a crock pot. After church, I had been told there would be street tacos. I had to sit up front again, but this time I was alone. We did more a cappella singing, read through some more Bible verses, and we were off to the races. I'm going to be honest, this sermon was legitimately hard to get through. Uh, without laughing. Not because of Brother Paul's intentional jokes. No, uh, because this sermon kept reminding me of funny things. But the name of the title of my sermon is The Nation Has AIDS. To start, the title of the sermon was AIDS of a Nation, at least in the video title, or as Brother Paul says, quote, The Nation Has AIDS. First funny thing. Everyone has AIDS! My grandma and my dog go blue! AIDS, AIDS, AIDS. The pulp has got it and so do you! AIDS, AIDS, AIDS. Second thing, AIDS of the nation is, um, 
Well, it's similar to Birth of a Nation, a famously racist early black and white film. Now, was that intentional? Who's to say? I will say that it's a little suspect given some of the other content of this sermon, but we'll get to that in a minute. How did we contract this disease in our nation that we have fallen to such a point that, hey, the Pride Parade was allowed to have a children's section yesterday? Uh, here in Spokane, uh, yesterday was Pride Parade. They had a children's section at a celebration of sexual orientation. And I don't care if you like, even if you're not a biblical believer, the idea that you should bring little children to a celebration of ungodly sex or like regular sex. I don't care if it's a strip club of heterosexual orientation. You don't bring children to such an event. I want you to keep a notice on how much they draw attention to children being near gay people, or in this case at a pride parade. I was at Pride. I was dressed in a spider going costume and there were lots of kids. A few of their parents even asked if I'd take pictures with them and I did. And that's all that happened to the kids who went to Pride. They had a good time, got some balloons and ice cream and they went home like everybody else. A far cry from the evil indoctrination they talk about here. But keep that in mind as you listen to the sermon and the next view as they expose their own children to stories from the Bible in explicit terms that I doubt most people would find age appropriate. Hey, why is it that you know, criminals are being protected. Like right now, I think uh, the state of California has passed or they're passing it in their Senate because cops won't respond. Under $500 is not a crime to steal. This is a blatant lie, as far as I can see, uh, was originated by right-wing crank Adam Carolla. Here he's talking about, I believe, Prop 47, which was made a law in 2014 and actually just penalizes certain thefts differently, such as commercial versus personal property. I'll provide some links down below, but you won't be surprised to know that these are just more examples of the church preaching outright lies to their congregation that they got online from right-wing pundits. But they're actually passing a law that store owners and their employees are not allowed to engage people that steal from them. Full-blown AIDS. So this gets said several times throughout the sermon, and um, all I could think about was this. All right, stop. Clearly, this is not the right environment for a child. I will take care of the dumpster baby until we figure out what to do with it. Dee, you're helping me. What? No, I'm not. You see what's happening here? You see this? Family values in this country are going down the toilet, and it's because of people like you. Men and women, raising a child together is a proven system a thousand years old. There are parental roles that need to be filled here, right? Otherwise, the kid winds up roaming the streets, having unprotected oh. sex with multiple partners, mm -hmm. sharing needles, and contracting the HIV virus, Ugh. and it's all your fault. Are you happy, Dee? Is this what you wanted? You just gave this baby full-blown AIDS. From here, the sermon becomes a little bit easier to follow, but not necessarily easier to listen to. We're going to go point by point and see what, according to the church, has led our society to a breaking point. The big point being that society doesn't read the Bible anymore. People stop following the word. They don't know the word themselves. So how can they judge in society what's right and wrong? Hey, when you come to church, it shouldn't be that you learn. Thank you. Um, when you come to church, it should help exhort you because you're already doing your own study. You're already reading the Bible. When you hear stuff behind the pulpit that doesn't sound correctly, you should be able to uh, ask and show a verse and chapter of where you were right or where you were wrong. One of the main points in this sermon we get, ironically, is vain babbling, as the Bible calls it, or as they interpret it, any additional commentary on the Bible. And you're like, oh, well, look at what this commentary says. See what this commentary says. Hey, why don't you just read the Bible? Hey, the vain babbling that men have done, because here's the thing, we're all prideful. Especially men, we can get really prideful. So, of course, a man who spent his whole life studying the Bible, he wants to write a book and put all his notes and be like, look what I figured out. Oh, people use the Bible, but with incorrect terms to fit their own agendas? You don't say, wow, that's really interesting. So let's get to society really started breaking down. Colleges. Every college started as a Bible college in America. The strongholds in atheism are the Bible colleges of old. Most of the people that go there, they're like, what's a new thing? What, what, how can I show my brilliance of an idea? And then people use other men's ideas to build new ideas and build new ideas and build new ideas. This is where all the denominations come from. This is where all f theories of thought come from. I mean, this is it, whether or not that's Marxism or other religions, like mindsets come from people sitting in colleges, not touched with the world, paid for by other people, and they come up, they just see what the new thing they can think of. So we can only think of Marxism as an ideology or philosophy, but then says it was made by people who never did anything or went out into the world. 
the Communist Manifesto was made by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels after they visited and saw for themselves the repugnant and inhuman working conditions of the Industrial Revolution in Britain. I go into quite a bit in my Dishonored video essay, if you want more info. But aside from that, this emphasis on Marxism and colleges being bastions of elites who've never experienced the real world is a mainstay of current right-wing pushes towards anti-intellectualism, something you see across anti-vaccine movements, anti-transgender movements, climate science, and plenty of other areas where the scientists doing the work find evidence counter to what the conservative position believes, so they need to find reasons to ignore them, to ignore the people who know the things. The Marxist remark in particular is reminiscent of Jordan Peterson. For those who don't know, he's a deep-fried, sentient Kermit the Frog puppet that spent too long in a Russian meat coma. Since Peterson's rise to prominence as the king of stupid people's smart people pantheon, Marxism, and by extension, cultural Marxism, have become much more common dog whistles for conservatives. Much like the term woke, which I did a whole video about, they just kind of mean something bad, but not anything in particular. If we truly loved God, we wouldn't allow false religion. We would argue against it and attack it continuously. Do you know in America, we don't like to remind ourselves about this because it was a problematic time. America used to have the open statement that uh, no Catholics, no Jews. That's a very problematic statement now. But understand, uh, at the time, it was only what I'll use the loose termination. We, Baptists, we don't identify as being Protestant, but we were not the Catholics because we viewed that they had taken the word and spoiled it through vain babbling. Hey, the Jews are literally a religion that hates Christ. They are a Christ hating, that's part of it. It's not like the Muslims where we feel they have wronged, they've interpreted not, you know, they've denied the sonship of God, that he is, a, you know, Jesus is God, but they hold him up as a prophet. Hey, the Hindus will say he's just another God. You give me a religion that actually hates Jesus, and I'm going to just say it is Judaism. Like, that's the only religion I'm aware of. Now, I don't know much about Judaism, but that doesn't sound right. Because you literally have a morality based on the Talmud, which means if you're not Jewish, you're not a person, you can be raped and stolen from and whatever. It's not really a crime if we ran it. Or you have Christian morality that even non-believers have human rights and they should be preached to, not forced to convert. And they actually should, uh, strangers in your land should be treated well. They should, be, they should have to uphold the laws that you have. Uh, if they're going to live among you, they should have beliefs similar, if not to you. But that's not what the Talmud is. You can't say Judo-Christian morality because that doesn't make any sense. The anti-Semitism here speaks for itself. I have no idea what he's even talking about. I wasn't able to find anything on Jews regarding non-Jews as subhumans. Boy, that sure was a lot of odd conspiratorial nods to Jews, huh? Like, just really cutting it close to the Nazi shit. But that's just one thing. I mean, maybe he starts talking about how we need to be more loving and accepting and welcoming like Jesus. Sometimes you're like, man, it just seems like the people attacking us just, man, they're so well-funded. They must have a lot of support. They must, that's all not true. See, a lot of times we can feel small because it's like, man, look at all the, the universities and the media and all this. Well, here's the thing is, it's not a fair play. Yeah. And what we I'm just saying is why this is an why the central bank was a contraction of HIV is this. It sold the entire nation, all its wealth. Because whether or not you own anything, the people that run the central bank can buy it all out. This is why there'll be a certain minority group that is on every board of every corporation. They didn't make any of the businesses but they will eventually own it. When I was coming into the sermon, I wasn't expecting the conspiracy theories about Jews controlling the world and being responsible for societal collapse. What else can I say except it's not over yet? So what else could Paul possibly hold up as a reason for America's AIDS? But I want you to tell me something that has gotten truly better since women were allowed to vote, since they were allowed to enter the public arena of politics. Let me tell you, that was hard fought against for a long time. But from that moment, family has been attacked. Education has been attacked. I mean, the scientists, like you, aren't, you have to not worry about people's emotions, which almost, if you have a male dominant area, that's like pushed against, which for science, you need to actually just talk about facts. Hey, 
following God, it needs to be what does God want, not how do you feel or how does this make me feel. Horrible sexism aside, Paul clearly doesn't care about science because he said in this sermon that colleges are dumb. He doesn't care about facts over feelings because as I've shown, many of the things he's citing as facts are outright lies made to manipulate the feelings of his audience. I need to leave the house so I can make a difference. All you're gonna do is be a, a crappier version of man without the honor. See, man gets some honor because when you go to work, you're degraded, you slave away at someone else's job for your boss, you're making money to support other people. If you're a slingle lady that's working so you can support yourself, there is no honor in it. You're gonna find that working isn't self-fulfilling in itself. See women, you just need to be living baby-making factories for a miserable man. Pump out as many kids as possible, regardless of socioeconomic standing. Let the man worry about that, and that's the best way to live. Not having a successful career or living on your own, harlot. So, so far, to recap, America has <laughs> Because Jews and women, there's just so much of this. This was almost the entirety of the sermon. If the channel is still up, you can find it for yourself, but you get the idea. There's no real need to push back or disprove so much of this because it's so self-evidently wrong, appealing to an outdated male-focused way of living that puts people like Paul in the most comfortable positions. But wait, we still gotta talk about the poor. Oh, divorce is wicked. You know what the next thing is? The welfare state. The welfare state and the child support, WIC, all of it. I'd like to call attention to a verse in Proverbs that seems to have slipped their mind, a, a personal favorite of mine because it leaves very little room for interpretation. Proverbs 14.31, whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. But what other people are the real problem in society? He starts going off on another tangent about public schools. Apparently his family has taken one of theirs out, which led to the kid flourishing at home and reading, which is good. But then we talk about this. But then you go to a school where the teacher, you know, I won't get into that. Schools used to be able to spank you, and you know, maybe Honda would have excelled a little bit better under that. Because currently, you know, that little woman back there, she mean. Don't do it, don't do what she wants. He's learning, yeah, he's gotta at least do that. So I mean, anyway. So he's bragging to a room full of laughing adults about his wife being mean and hitting their kids. But unfortunately, we've spent so much time on women and the Jews, we don't have time for the rest of it. So just give us the cliff notes. I didn't talk about the sexual revolution. Let me talk about something that, you know, we got into society. Instead of just, you, you, you get married and you learn everything you need to know. Oh, we'll teach about, it. we'll do all this, you know. I mean, people are doing all types of surgeries to stop pregnancies, you know, that would poison their bodies. They're not learning what a loving relationship is because frankly, they might have more connection with their roommate than they do with their, you know, sexual partners. Yeah, you wonder why you don't feel you're connected or you have purpose in this life? It's because you're taking some of the most precious things and not, you're spreading your seed out to the world. You're not investing it into someone. You're not gaining a personal, different relationship. It's just, you're, everything in your life is disposable. Hey, you know, we could say, you know, debts, military industrial complexes, essentially, you know, all these things, you know, hey, kids aren't even allowed to know who wins now. This is a small point, but participation trophies have been a steadfast part of conservatism for as long as I can remember. But I also grew up with them. I got trophies for playing softball and stuff as a kid 20 years ago. It's not even relatively recent either. I'll link a Slate article down below that digs into the history of the practice dating back to 1922. This, like most everything modern conservatives like to scaremonger about, is an easily disproved fallacy used to rile their bases who already agree with them. So with that in mind, let's wrap this up. You walk away from God, the land will spew you out. That is what every study shows. And I, you know, so what can you do as the land vomits out the people that are? Go back to reading the word of God. That's what every study shows. Wow. I'd love someone to find me one study supporting what he says here. Just, just one. So once the sermon is over, I took a brief bathroom break before seeing about those street tacos. The tacos were still being prepared at that point, so I stood idly by and waited for the inevitable conversation from inquiring church minds to come to me. I was introduced to Robert, another preacher from a sister congregation, and we spoke briefly about my history and how I had found the church. So did you, uh, was last week your first week? How'd you hear about our church? Uh, the internet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
I had prepared a backstory that I was from a divorced family that my father lived in Texas, but I had moved here with my mother, who was into a more accepting version of the faith. Robert then asked if I had heard about them through the news, alluding to Jason Graber wishing death on people like me. <laughs> I was going to ask you if you heard about us through the news because, like, uh, Brother Jason did a sermon on uh, protecting well, children. I stopped. He preached about how um, people who hurt children, child predators, you know, should get the death penalty. You want a sandwich? Because yeah. that's what Jesus taught. Because he said, you know, whosoever shall offend one of these little ones, it were better for him than a millstone were tied about his neck and they were, you know, cast into the depth of the sea. So he preached a sermon about like uh, parents that are transitioning, they're like preteen kids, you know, giving them surgeries and all this. And it, it, they took a clip from his sermon where he was talking about how those people should get the death penalty, and it just went viral on uh, Twitter or whatever. So yeah. this has it's like two million views. Well, and, uh, oh, here, here's some forks. That I, that was the, the clip that I did see. Uh, <laughs> hey, I kind of great. The response was laughter. See, this hate speech wasn't anything to be afraid of for them. It was a marketing opportunity, a signal sent out to people who believed the same extremist beliefs. People like Tyler Dinsmore, who were looking for excuses and encouragement to hurt those they disagreed with, those who were different. And they found it in a place like this. I then briefly go into another element of my backstory I had prepared, that I had a member of my extended family, my cousin, who's non-binary. I actually have a niece um, who you know, goes to goes to public school and just decided uh, that she's one of these. Oh, sorry, buddy. Uh, one of these they thems and uh, yeah, her mom of course is you know like encouraging it very much so. These talking points that parents are pushing identities on kids rather than them finding for themselves are common throughout right wing media. Soon enough, we got out street tacos and sat down in the small congregation dining room just a few feet from the kitchen. Brother Paul, who had preached the sermon, and another congregant I will refer to as Greg, joined us. At that point, Daniel Kutsar, who had been attending a family wedding, came to the church and joined the conversation. They talk a bit about how their channel has been deleted in the wake of Jason Graber's transphobic screed. I don't know why they deleted it. Obviously, it's because of the... Sorry, you constantly... Not constantly, but... YouTube, like, they delete uh, our, uh, the YouTube channels from our type of churches without any warning. So that's kind of how it happened with us. Like, they just deleted it, but they, they didn't. They just said, oh, we don't, you guys keep on preaching the wrong stuff. They then briefly advocate for Rumble and Gab, free speech platforms most often used by bigots like Nick Fuentes, who is banned from YouTube for anti-Semitic hate speech. Apps, you know, Rumble, you can yeah, like put on uh, Roku. I know that a lot of people have Roku. I got Rumble on my Roku. And I watch a lot of the new IFB sermons on Rumble because I don't have to worry about, you know, them getting deleted. At least not yet. Well, I had a channel on Gab, but I, it, it got I, I ended up deleting it because I couldn't stop the payment on uploaded videos. And yeah, Gab is, they make it where you have to email them to be able to change your, like to be able to stop them. And because these people think about gay people even more than I, a queer person does, the conversation somehow jumps from Rumble to Pride. However, this jab at Fox and Greg's point about Tucker gave me a good opportunity to further the conversation. Shouldn't everybody like know all they need to know about Fox News, what they did with Tucker? I mean, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> did anybody hear anything else about that? Like what actually happened with Tucker? Tucker got fired for opening his mouth, yeah. basically for telling too much truth and going against the narrative because Fox News is a corporation. They're owned by, you know, big companies and actually Disney bought Fox. So, because he wasn't liberal enough, you know, they fired him. So at this point, I'm in. They're comfortable talking to me in their own parlance, asking questions meant to drive me deeper down the rabbit hole to truth and engage me in their world if I'm already converted. I nodded along comfortably, feigning both interest and understanding at how these talking points connected. To the or Hannity, who's or just Hannity. a military Hannity. industrial complex. Yeah. Yeah. That's why Tucker got fired. Big yeah. Pharma, I, military industrial complex, those two. I like Tucker more than the, 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 he, least, was, he was, was the only guy I watched on Fox News. So after he got fired, yeah. I quit watching. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't been to the website in weeks ever since. It's like at least Tucker, he gets canceled. Like, that's, that's how you know he's more righteous than all these pastors. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you yeah. know, for real. Yeah. We then get a more in-depth conversation about Tucker, where it became more evident to me that these guys had all watched plenty of his show as they compared and contrasted him with Jesse Waters and Sean Hannity, 
two other prominent Fox News hosts. And then Greg chimes in, mentioning that Pastor Steven Anderson, one of the founding members of the church, was on InfoWars. Oh, have you seen that? Yeah. Did you see Pastor Anderson was on InfoWars again? Again? Talking about the King James Bible, there's a new there's a new kid on InfoWars that, sure that is apparently it's saved. It's on my wall. I'll check it out. This is recent? Um, yeah, yeah, apparently this kid nice. is on if, Hopefully Alex Jones allows his kid on more. The conversation carries on for a bit until Greg calls back something said in the sermon. You know, what being a Baptist is about in the first place, I mean, that was the whole, I mean, that's where we got our name, was the Catholics actually used to make fun of us for rebaptizing people as they were adult converts, and they would call us Anabaptists, which means rebaptizers. So, can we go back to that? No Jews, no Catholics here. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that that was a, used to be a thing in the country. Yeah. That's great. The group laughs in response to the casual dog whistling to anti-Semitism, but like Brother Paul sidestepped without saying anything explicit, it felt as though they were cautious about me and my presence and my ability to handle their more blatant rhetoric. After about an hour of sitting with the group, I decided to take my leave as they prepared to go soul winning, where they'd take to the streets and give a watered down, non hable version of their doctrine to unsuspecting people. Very similar to the obviously pre-prepared speech I had received the previous Sunday. I left feeling more emotionally drained than before, and I think that's when the full scope of this project hit me. I'd been drawn to this church by the virulent homophobia and transphobia. Of course, I expected to find a conservative undercurrent, but I didn't realize how blatantly misogyny and anti-Semitism would rear their heads. The sermon was one thing. It wasn't until the brief glimpses of ideology when they let their guard down that it sunk in for me that this is the constant state of these congregants. They have no consumption of media aside from what furthers their agenda. They craft for themselves a literal echo chamber. Robert Larson would take the stage for the second sermon that day, but I wasn't missing much. It was a Bible-heavy sermon that stayed away from the issues of the world in favor of classic preaching, which, for the most part, I have no issue with. There were some interesting tidbits, however. You know, we get, we get in trouble because people say, you're not supposed to hate the f God doesn't hate them. Well, I beg to differ. God hates them. The Bible says he does. You know, it's kind of interesting that Peter compares Sodom and Gomorrah to these false prophets. And I guarantee you there were false prophets probably in Sodom and Gomorrah tonight saying, peace, peace. It's okay that you're a Sodomite. God's not mad at you. You know, don't be surprised when somebody comes into our church, you know, one day, and they, they end up being a deceitful worker that transform themselves into an apostle of Christ. They act like one of us. This is just another fancy way of saying wolves in sheep's clothing. For the devil's ministers, the reprobate false prophets, you know, they can act like an angel of light. This sermon got me a little alarmed for a brief section, warning of infiltrators. I thought it was maybe too big of a coincidence for a sermon immediately after my arrival. So to dissuade any suspicion that I was who I said, I did my best to give foolproof white Christian verification. I made a Facebook page and reposted old memes and Bible verses. This Facebook endeavor was a eye-opening experience unto itself, as to fully sell the act and be able to repost content that would align with Evan's worldview, I needed to join several groups. Unsurprisingly, the groups were full of the same jumping to conclusions, broad assumptions, conspiracy theories, and hate speech. Being the hot button issue of Pride Month, I shared memes promoting straight pride and even joined some straight pride Facebook groups where there was no shortage of blatant transphobia, homophobia, and self-persecution taken part in by people who, much like the congregation, desperately wanted to feel they were more hated and therefore more important than they actually were. Eventually, I got a few friends from the congregation, including Daniel and Robert, and a few other congregants I've chosen to keep anonymous, all of whom went through my Facebook wall and gave likes to the memes and Bible verses I had shared. Over the next week or so, I'd periodically check in on Facebook to approve the odd friend request or share more memes. Overall, it was just a small bit of successful cover that gave a slightly wider peephole into how this kind of hate festers. Casually. Going into this third sermon, I wasn't sure if I would keep this project going for much longer. 
I didn't want to drag this into a months-long undercover sting op, and it would only be a matter of time before I got caught up in a story I had made up on the fly. I got dressed up in another preconceived straight-passing outfit with clashing colors and no style, and I was off. Today was Father's Day, so I expected some harsh biblical truths on child-rearing. Now, due to an error on the church's part, there was an issue with footage for the first sermon. It never got uploaded to Facebook or YouTube, to my knowledge. Luckily, I kept my recorder on at all times. I walked in and was briefly greeted by a few people I recognized. Being Father's Day, this was the most packed I had seen the church, with an extra effort made to have all the families in attendance. I didn't count exactly, but I'd say there were about 15 to 20 people, with seven or eight being small children. Some people asked me if I was a father, to which I responded, I hope not. A joke I'm used to making if someone asks if I have kids, but I don't think it quite landed with this audience. We then sat down and commenced the service, starting with another wonderful classic rendition of a Christian hymn, though this time there was, mercifully, a piano accompaniment, the first and only I experienced during my time there. After the regular routine of hymn verse hymns, uh, Brother Daniel Kutar took the pulpit to begin the sermon. Daniel began by lamenting that fathers are only recognized once a year for all they do. All right, good morning, everyone. Happy Father's Day. It's uh, pretty, you know, only, only once a year they get, the men get recognized, so you gotta enjoy it, so. As it would happen, Father's Day originated here in Spokane, Washington in 1909 after a church grower heard a sermon about Mother's Day and she wanted an equal holiday for fathers. Mother's Day, however, had been established first in 1908, just a year previously, officially. Eventually, these holidays caught on, but the fact remains that there's no real historical or religious significance to these holidays, and they're widely regarded as greeting card holidays, or holidays that are, today are mostly kept alive by companies looking to make a little extra uh, revenue between the big ones like Christmas, Easter, and the 4th of July. History lesson aside, today's lesson would focus on Ephesians 6.4, which instructs fathers to not provoke their children to wrath, but bring them up in the admonition of the Lord. Pretty standard Bible stuff that I think even most agnostics would be okay with. You have a moral code informed by your religion, you want to instill a respect in your children. But unfortunately, that's not all the sermon would be about, because the chapter read for the day, which the sermon would actually focus on, was the story of Tamar and Amnon. For this section, I'd like to put particular content warnings for sexual assault, incest, and violence. For those who don't know, Tamar was the daughter of King David, one of many he had with his multiple wives. In 2 Samuel, the story is told that she is violently forced to have sex with her brother Amnon. The story goes that another brother, Amemnon, finds out and kills Amnon. It's a horrific story of violation and violence, and somehow, they make it all about men. A lot of this sermon would be simply going down the verses and explaining bit by bit what happens to Tamar and Amnon, and not in uncertain terms either. So we see here that Amnon, he makes clear his intent for the, this whole time. He's like, makes obvious, hey, I, I, wanna, I wanna sleep with you. And, and basically Amnon uh, tell, tells her what he wants to do, and Tamar, she gives Amnon six reasons to why this is wrong. To why you know he shouldn't do this, and first she calls it rape. She's like, "Hey, I'm, I don't want to be. I don't want to sleep with you." So he's like, "Hey, don't rape me." Even in the recording, you can hear the small toddlers and infants sitting just a few rows behind me. And as much as people like this have talked about teachers and parents who accept trans or queer kids being groomers, pedophiles, and deserving of death, I can't help but wonder how much hearing something like this in such explicit terms at such a young age would affect the mentality of a child. Conservatives like this want to take books out of schools that explain topics like consent, racism, and history, and acceptance in age-appropriate and simple terms, but are okay with directly teaching stories about rape, incest, and murder. How they're important to men instead of the women that are victimized. But then we talk about how this relates to America today, and how modern American men can learn from David's poor example. And in America, you know, we, uh, because we're so rich, we're so prosperous, because we're all making so much money, 
a lot of a lot of fathers they don't really feel the pain as much you know when their sons do something foolish when their sons are are you know buying drugs and just wasting money and just getting tickets and DUIs like a lot of parents will spend thousands of dollars to bail their children out of jail and but David we see that he he was prosperous and today in America as fathers we are prosperous we have money and and you know and but just because we can afford to lose money because of our kids we should not you know we shouldn't we shouldn't allow it Daniel was losing me with the sermon I'll be honest the ties between David's wealth and modern fathers were tenuous at best, especially when you consider last week's sermon about how the middle class was being destroyed and had no money. From here, we talk more about how modern parents are failing their children, and it gets darker. Content warning again. And whenever they, whenever they act up, whenever they like you know, cry, what we, the way parents usually quiet them down is like, oh, here's the candy, here's what you want, just shut them up, you know? Even even this morning, I, I I did a light spanking on my uh, my son for for playing on the piano, and, and I did a light light spanking, and he just falls on the floor like it, it does a tantrum, you know. And I was like, well, I'm not gonna allow that, you know. Most parents are like, oh, no, it's okay, here's a candy, you know, quiet down. I don't want to be embarrassed in front of the church, but no, I just took him out there and I gave him a harsher spanking, like, hey, you're not allowed to do that. Not only are you not allowed to play on the piano, you're not allowed to you know to fall on the ground and you know and do a tantrum. Here's another example of a church member spanking their kid, who, when they fall on the floor, the way Daniel responds is to give him an even harsher punishment. Now, spanking is a sore subject. I myself was spanked as a kid, but I don't remember it ever helping me correct behavior. Eventually, my mom had to resort to something else. I do remember feeling angry and violated. I remember the pain, but I can't remember anything I did to deserve it. And I should say that when I was a kid, it was more normalized than it is now. And my mother probably had a pretty gentle hand compared to some other parents. However, with what we know now, with all the pediatric research we have, I will say any modern parent is sorely mistaken if you think that a grown man hitting a child and then hitting them harder when they react naturally to receiving pain from somebody they're supposed to trust is anything other than abuse. If you think that, it, you're absolutely wrong. In 2021, in a study titled Corporal Punishment and Elevated Neural Response to Threat in Children, the Society for Research and Child Development, using 50 years of data and research on the long-term effects of corporal punishment like spanking, found that children who are spanked are more likely to develop long-term issues with depression, anxiety, uh, difficulty engaging in school, and other regulated daily activities. And also that the brain responses in children that are spanked are more similar to severe maltreatment, including similar MRI patterns to sexual abuse victims. I'll link two articles down below, both of which cite plenty of sources if anyone doubts the findings. The rest of the sermon is this. Daniel goes to great lengths to say that parents should love their children and that fathers need to work harder than mothers because they're working to support the family and still need to make time for kids. It's the same traditionalist casual sexism, and I don't really need to play much more of the sermon because I just summed up a whole half hour here in this last paragraph. But of course, we have to talk about how the world will win if parents don't teach children properly. Public school. So you know, the devil now has control over the public schools, and the devil is ready to teach our kids, you know, the sodomite agenda, to teach how they can be a, boys can be girls and girls can be boys. It, it, the, the, the schools are not teaching kids that hey, if, if you think you're a, you're a cat, here's some litter. You know, you can, you can go pee in, in this cat litter. Cat litter. Where do I know that from? Oh right, the beginning of the video where I provided evidence showing how that lie spread, how it was debunked, yet continues to proliferate uncritically among conservatives. And this is one way how it's filtered from right wing commentary and social media to a trusted speaker the congregation who will believe his every word. When the sermon finally ended, I stood up and made for the restroom, but not being stopped by a familiar face, though one I had yet to meet. Jason Graber. Hi, my name's Jason. Uh, uh, have we met yet? No. Uh, 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 I was speaking to Jason Graber, the very same Jason whose vitriolic spewing had put this church in my sights. I shook his hand and introduced myself and I don't think he ever knew he was shaking hands with someone he thought should be shot and hung in his own words. I made polite conversation as he explained why he hadn't been there the past two weeks, including an absence last week because of a male family member. For the privacy, I won't include that audio. 
After a brief bathroom respite where I could reset my recording, I went back to the kitchen and common area where the congregation was taking part in a catered lunch from a local Philly cheesesteak joint. I took a sandwich and joined the men at the table. From here, it's a little hard to hear everything over multiple conversations, laughing kids, and just general audio quality, but there are still some important and eye-opening bits of idol-friendly conversation. Phil asked me what I do for work. As part of my predetermined backstory, I picked something believable, but that kept me from too much scrutiny or needing to know too much. I was a security guard for an agency that stationed guards at different corporate sites, events, and locations, and right now I was working in a storage unit facility. So where do you These work, things bro? things are gonna run the world through that. Yeah, right! <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I like to do is type. I work for a security company this that are like, <laughs> contracts out to... They bought it quickly enough and eventually chat drifted to working. Uh, Jason sat nearby as did Phil, Greg, and Paul. Daniel sat at an adjacent table with his wife as they ate. The conversation veers from my work as a security guard to the ability to take down a suspect who has a knife if I need to. Crazy people are like around the streets doing lots of knife attacks, I guess, on, in France. Well, aren't there no guns there? Oh yeah, they got gun control like crazy. They, really? try, they try to ban knives in England. We then get to talking about knife attacks in France, a common anti-immigrant right-wing talking point that frames Middle Eastern immigrants as dangerous due to a spate of extremist violent attacks. This idle conversation then shifts to vague half-recollections of what gun laws and restrictions exist in which countries. I listen along with half-hearted interest, looking for an opportunity to jump back into the conversation. Eventually, Phil remembers my story about my mother from the first Sunday and asks if I'm going to try and get her saved. Are you going to try to get your mom saved? Yeah. You know, yeah, um, at some point. And then, oh yeah, I, I didn't tell you because uh, last week I talked to um, Robert, and, Robert yeah, about it because we were talking about my family and there's this whole... So my family raised me. I think I told you that my mom goes to more, yeah, more non-denominational kind of open woo-woo. Mm -hmm. uh, and my aunt is also the same way. And her daughter um, recently came out. Came out. As oh really? One of the like, like a. I made sure to put the right spin on the explanation, not wanting to appear too familiar with trans or non-binary terms. It's something I picked up from my time observing conservative media. They don't know the right terms to use because they don't bother to learn anything about the people they talk about all the time. It worked like a charm, and turns out I ended up learning a lot about trans people from Phil. That sucks, because once the person like becomes a reprobate, they're like capable of everything. Like they'll, because their conscience is removed, and that's how you got like people like Palmer, and because their their conscience is seared with a hot iron, they're capable to kill you, whatever you know, and they're super dangerous. So. Here he was telling me, a reprobate according to them, that I wasn't just evil, but that I had no moral conscience, that I was like Dahmer, that I could just kill and murder someone. The fact that I spent so many hours in their company at this point speaks volume for my propensity towards violence, even in the face of this church quite literally telling me how people like me should die. I responded with quiet attempts at understanding, trying to get to the bottom of why they think this way, where they get it from. Of course, in that moment, however, I had to keep the conversation moving. We talked more about my transgender niece. She's 12 what? going on 13. And that's sad. You know, what do you think? Do you think it's like the, the, the school weird. system? The the, you know, like, I'm not involved enough in her life to like know. Yeah. Greg then steps in to discern that my niece can probably still be saved because as a 12 to 13 year old, she's not quote, burning in her lust which is, to my knowledge, not a very normal way to talk about or think about a prepubescent girl. Oh, yeah, she's not they burning, they burning in her lust like, towards another. No, not, 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 I don't think so. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I have 
chicken wire? Well, this is that. Like, really I was really excited. But I see what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing that I believe that can happen is you preach her the gospel. Or show her, bring one of those Bible Way to Heaven DVDs. And just be like, here you go. You know, and just kind of explain to her a little bit how it's a free gift. It's not of works. Jesus paid it all for you. And if she gets saved, she's saved. And, you know, a saved person can't become a reprobate or a saved person can't become a, a flaming home. Yeah, but we bought them from you know. Here's the thing, Phil, you saved me, remember? Yet on the night before my second sermon, the night of pride, I was drinking and kissing and dancing with a cute non-binary in a gay bar. So I guess you can be a flaming homo and still hear the word. Then Greg suggested that, failing the word, I should show my niece's mom the suicide rates for trans individuals. To which I had a reply that just kind of slipped out. Listen, well, I don't know maybe you show her the suicide rates. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right, so. But if you want good cake, it's probably 50%. Yeah, the cake is so good. It's not a spoiler. Maybe just show her some studies on that or something. Well, well and I, so that was when I first found out about it. That's kind of what I tried to like okay. counter with because I, you know, I've heard about that kind of thing too. And the, the oh, argument they gave me was that. You know, that's because of them not feeling accepted. Nobody liked the cake. And so they're they okay. doing their best to counteract that but, by yeah, accepting really funny, I could tell what, like, in that way. So Greg gave me an erroneous stat on trans suicide that's around 50%. The closest I could find to this was a survey that stated 50% of trans youth had considered, not attempted, or even succeeded. Conservatives like Ben Shapiro and Matt Walsh and the whole Daily Wire squad have been going hard on the same talking point that parents shouldn't enable their kids because they will kill themselves. The real danger is that trans people face depression and anxiety because so many people who hate them just for being who they are. People like this church who call people they don't know reprobates, capable of murder, pedophiles who deserve to be shot. And when I pushed back against Greg's logic, with that fact, he had nothing to say. The subject got dropped. Soon after, Jason inquires about how long I've been in the city, and we talk a bit about hometowns. So have you lived in Spokane for a long time? Yeah, I, I say as long as it's mattered, because uh, I, I moved up here with my mom when uh, she and my dad divorced around middle school for me. So yeah, it's, it's, it's like not quite yeah. hometown, yeah. but basic, like for all of my adult life, it has been. So it's famous well, I've lived here since 2016. We talk, the conversation is friendly. Jason is, at first blush, a likable guy. He is not as socially awkward as some other congregants, but like everyone else, he's greeted me warmly with a smile and conversation as I share food from their table. In a moment like this, I almost forget his vivid fantasizing about my own death, about my body hung from a bridge where people can see. We're just two dudes chatting, like anyone would at a bar or in line at a supermarket. Looking back now, the distance is pretty striking. The conversation carries on into the kind of casual chat I'd have with my own coworkers or friends in any number of settings. Talking about nice drives in and out of town, how we like where we live, were not for being called a reprobate, I'd even say the conversation was nice. We kept talking and eventually I got to talking with Greg who had been fairly quiet about his job. He had a background in IT, which I was legitimately curious about. More than most, Greg had a habit of jutting the conversation towards politics. The light sexism of mentioning some women want the heat changed was just an off ramp for his real grievances. Yeah, the office yeah, environment. Well, and then you have a, a, a lot of, uh, just kind of, liberal, purple hair, man, you know, the, it's, lo it's pretty woke where if you're a single white guy, you know, good luck trying to, you know, nowadays trying to get anywhere. Greg, you may remember, had previously brought up Steven Anderson's appearance on Infowars and recommended some Rumble content to me. He also made the jab about going back to not allowing Jews and Catholics. He's the kind of guy they all thought I was too, a straight white man looking for other people to blame their problems on. By this time, I had spent another hour or so chatting with the congregation after church. As they prepared to once again go soul winning, I departed, thanking them for the food and telling them it was nice talking and seeing them again. On this Sunday, I left the church more exhausted than before. I tried to think back on everything that had been preached the last three weeks. It was a dizzying array of misleading Bible study, debunked talking points, and violent rhetoric, all touted as an objectively correct 
loving lifestyle. I wasn't sure I was done yet, at least until I saw the second sermon for the week, after it had been uploaded to the church YouTube channel later. This time, Jason Graber took the stage to talk about either being on God's side or the side of the world. The entire sermon was an absolutist philosophy, uh, that it was either their way or the highway to hell. Of course, we couldn't talk about the state of the world without airing some grievances along the way. Turns out, transgender kids are just sacrifices to Satan. If, if the very first thing that comes up, it says, Tophet is a location in the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom, near Jerusalem, where they would go and perform sacrifices to Molak, and specifically child sacrifices, where they would pass children through the fires of Molak, like the Bible talks about and condemns every single time. You know, if you just, you know, I find it very interesting that if you just type that word into Google, that's the very first thing that pops up. And you say, well, what does that have to do with today? Well, what do we have going on today? I mean, they were sacrificing children to Molak back then, but, but, but I mean, what's, what's the big thing that's going on today? Abortion. Right? We, well, we have abortion, but also... We have, we, have, we have parents that want to take their children, right, and basically offer them to Satan. Okay, they want to take them and they want to chop their genitals off before, they're, before they even reach puberty. Okay, that's, that is what's going on today. This is another talking point touted most often by Matt Walsh, and it has no basis in facts, because these talking points are meant to cite facts, they're meant to spread fear. Jesse Gender uh, has a wonderful video that digs deep into how this rhetoric is false in her video on Matt Walsh, which you should check out down below. But for now, I'll just say to Jason's claim that people are cutting off genitals before puberty is that one of the youngest sex reassignment surgeries ever took place recently on a New Hampshire teen who had been undergoing transition for most of her life. She was 17. For reference, that's one year older than New Hampshire's age of consent. And it's certainly far from being prepubescent. You may also notice he continues mentioning Moloch, who is a mainstay citation for QAnon and adjacent conspiracists like Alex Jones. They use Judges 19 as justification for their bigotry, and very fittingly, we get Jason talking about the very controversy that got me started at this church, bringing everything full circle. Go ahead and turn to Judges chapter number 19. Judges chapter number 19. Now, I think everybody knows, you know, everybody's heard that basically I was in the news you know, the, 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 uh, the news, they took one little clip of me uh, from a sermon that was like, two, it was like two months ago. But, uh, you know, they took that little clip and they put it out there and there's all this controversy, you know, and, and all the no local news stations made stories about me and they're, and they're just all concerned about the danger and everything that, you know, oh man, he's going to cause somebody to go and commit violence. Well, you know, it, it, it's, it's real interesting that they're concerned about violence being committed against somebody when, they, when they're the ones that edited out the part where I say, hey, the Christians fight a spiritual fight. We don't fight a physical fight. We're not here to take violence out on anybody. Amen. We're just here to preach the truth and what the Bible actually says and what should happen to these people. Yeah, That's what we're here to do. We're here to tell the truth by fighting that spiritual battle. Okay. But, but they're worried. They're worried about safety of people. Well, you know what? It, 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 it would be the greatest thing for, the, for these news organizations. They would just love it if somebody, if somebody somewhere were to get hurt. They, I mean, they, they, would, they would love it if somebody went out and started, you know, shooting up a, uh, you know, a, one of these queer bars or something. They would love it. And they would love it if somebody came in here and, and, and tried to shoot up this church. They would love that as well. Why? Because, oh, think of all the new, think of the huge headline we could have from that. But Jason, you know who else might love it? the people you're preaching to. Remember this tidbit where they said that they would praise any violence that would befall the sodomites? Let's, every single time a sodomite dies of AIDS, let's just rejoice. I'm like, yes, another one died. Whenever, you know, let's pray for more, uh, for more Muslims to go and shoot up these, these gay nightclubs. And whenever, you know, 50 of them die, I'm like, yes, less pedophiles on, on this earth. Yeah. Let's rejoice, let's be glad. Amen. You know why? Because that's what they, hey, that's our reward. Jason also must have forgotten about Tyler, the congregant from a sister congregation who was arrested for threatening to shoot up a pride parade. Tyler quite obviously had previous extremist leanings, but this church and its doctrines only seem to make it worse. All I said was that people, these parents that are taking their prepubescent boys and having their nuts chopped off, which is, which is horribly criminal, 
It's worse than pedophilia because, you know, when a child experiences pedophilia, you know, that's a, that is a, is a mental scar and, you know, maybe there's a disease that was passed, but at least he has all of his anatomy still there. But you know what? When, when, when these children, when, 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 they, when these wicked parents have that done to them, you know, that, that, they're, they're, they're physically maimed, okay, along with all the mental scarring. That is, that's why, I mean, you take that mental scar from that and you couple that with part of their anatomy being gone forever, which can never come back, that's why their suicide rate is 50%. That's the reason why. And so I think it's worse than pedophilia. And, you know, all throughout the entire history of this country, and, it, and you know, even all the way up until even today, you know, the, the, the public opinion towards pedophilia has pretty much always been, hey, put those people to death. Yeah. You know, I saw a bumper sticker just like, just last week on, somebody, on, on the back of somebody's car that said, kill your local pedophile. And so, you know, so, so people still hold this opinion today. So this is not some wild, crazy opinion. We're, we're, when, when I'm saying that somebody that has done something that I believe is worse than pedophilia, right, and I just explained why that is, you know, it's hard to imagine something worse than that. But here we are, right? So they want to paint me as a crazy person for saying that those people that have committed that horrible crime need to be executed. Again, the insistence that all gay people are pedophiles is bizarre to say the least. But on the subject of mistreating children, Jason then pivots to another Bible story. Keep in mind that this story is told to an audience with small children in attendance. Beset the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house, the old man saying, bring forth the man that came into thine house that we may know him. So what's going on here is that, you know, these certain sons of Belial, they surrounded the house, right? They say that they want, they want him to bring out the man so that we can know him. And of course, we know that that's not, that's, he's not saying they want to shake his hand and say, hi, my name's Jason, right? That's not what they're trying to say. You know, the, the, the Bible, you know, is, is, uh, uses, uses words sometimes, so, you know, he's not saying the exact thing. That's right. This is the story about men in the city wanting to rape angels. Very famous story from the Bible that, at first glance, is about how evil it is to be gay to some people. Except the guy who owns the house gives them a woman they assault to death. And so, you know, obviously he's offering his daughter and, and the guy's maiden for what? as a replacement, right? And this is a, this is a bizarre thing to do. You know, this, I don't know what, 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 what's wrong with this guy where he's just, he's just gonna offer, you know, his own daughter to be raped by these people. I mean, you know, what a wicked, horrible thing to do. I mean, that is, that is sad, that's horrible. But, you know, this, you know, this type of thing, this is what I wanna prevent from happening, okay? I wanna be like a white blood cell in society that, it, it, that is preventing this kind of disease from seeping in to where people would have their house surrounded by a bunch of sodomites, you know, and, and demanding to rape everybody. After six sermons, I had long grown weary of how these preachers take a verse, admit that sometimes the Bible will only hint at something like Jason did a few minutes ago, and then take another verse and say it's exactly like something that doesn't exist today. It's blatant misleading, twisting the Bible into a logical pretzel to justify fear and bigotry. But we still need to hear what else happens in the story and big content warning ahead. You know, the, the sodomites, they raped her until she died. Okay, now this is, this is the reality of what these people are like. Okay, you know, Hollywood has been brainwashing people for decades to make it seem like they're just normal, like there's nothing wrong with them. They're just like everybody else. They just have this one thing where they just, you know, instead of liking women, eh, they just like men. But, he, but that's a lie, though. That, that picture that Hollywood has been trying to present to, to the general public for decades is a lie. It is, it is simply not true. And, you know, a lot of times these sodomites, they can put on a real friendly face. And, and we'll get in later, you know, and they like to creep in, to, they'll even like to creep into churches, okay? But, but, you know, just because somebody is able to put on a nice face and to put on a show and he's able to trick people 
in, in, into believing a lie about what they really are, that doesn't take away from the fact that the Bible makes it clear what these people are like. Is it me? Am I the drama? I don't think I'm the drama. Am I the villain? I don't think I'm the villain. Jokes aside, while I may have been the one referenced here, it's totally possible. But of course, this is all biblical teaching, right? I mean, this is literally what God thinks about all queer people. And so uh, we, we can see that, that she dies on the threshold from being raped by these freaks all night. And, and it says in verse number 28, and says, And he said unto her, Up, and let us be going. But none answers. Then the man took her up on his ass, and the man rose up and got him unto his place. And when he was come into the house, he took a knife and laid hold on his concubine and divided her together with her bones into 12 pieces and sent her into all the coasts of Israel. It's a, it's a very gruesome thing that he did, you know, dividing her up and sending, you know, the pieces into the different tribes of Israel. But you know what, he, he, I think he was trying to get a point across. He's like, look, this is what's happening. You know, I mean, obviously there's probably like a note, you know, that went with the body part. You know, I mean, I, I, I've never had this happen to me, but you know, something shows up in the mail, you know, and it's a body part with a note on it that says, hey, you know, this is what's going on, um, you know, in the tribe of Benjamin. Again, I couldn't help but point out the hypocrisy of saying that teachers and family of queer people accepting and loving their kids are groomers and pedophiles that kids shouldn't know anything about sexual identity or gender identity while they're young. But then indoctrinating young minds like this with ancient stories of rape, murder, and mutilation retrofitted to have modern meaning as bigoted cautionary tales against queer people. You know, all these doctors are supposed to take the Hippocratic Oath, which, uh, you know, the, the only thing I know of the Hippocratic Oath is do no harm, right? I mean, that's part of being a doctor is you're not supposed to do any harm to your patients. You're supposed to help them and heal them you're not supposed to hurt them. And in fact, doctors can be sued for something called malpractice, where they, where they, uh, where they did something wrong and, and, and injured a patient, right? And hurt a patient because that was a violation of the Hippocratic Oath. But, 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 but nobody seems to be shocked today when parents are taking their children to these, uh, you know, to these hospitals or these places where these, the surgery's done and they're harming the children. They're permanently damaging the children. You know, they're chopping them up. Kind of like, kind of like in Judges chapter number 19. Nobody seems to be very shocked anymore. And, you know, it's, 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 it's quite disturbing that the level of, of, of general wickedness this nation has gone to, where it's just normal. First off, the term genital wickedness owns. Wanted on a t-shirt. Second, the story wasn't about surgery. A surgery, by the way that doesn't exist and doesn't happen, but a woman who was raped and murdered being dismembered. So they're not the same at all, actually, like even a little bit. And by now you'll probably have noticed the exact same right-wing mutilation rhetoric we've seen time and time again, that gender affirmation for trans youth, which by the way, never involves surgery at a young age, is somehow permanently damaging them and that doctors who perform these surgeries should be sued for malpractice. The reality is that an overwhelming majority of trans kids go through gender therapy, don't get any prepubescent or early teen surgery, and instead get hormone blockers, which cause no permanent damage. One of the best takedowns I've seen of this rhetoric was a report from the Endocrine Society in the wake of anti-trans legislation in Texas and Florida, stating that, quote, healthcare providers should not be punished for providing evidence-based care that is supported by major international medical groups, including the Endocrine Society, American Medical Association, the American Psychological Association, and the American Academy of Pediatrics, and clinical practice guidelines." End quote. Also, quote, only reversible treatments to delay puberty are recommended for younger adolescents after they have entered puberty, according to our clinical practice guideline and joint policy perspective issued with the Pediatric Endocrine Society. Puberty delaying medication is a safe and conservative approach that gives teenagers and their families more time to explore their options. The same treatment has been used for decades to treat precocious puberty." End quote. I've linked it below, and it has plenty of reading if you want the facts instead of whatever Jason is doing. You know, people have all kinds of objections, right? You know, how can you say that these people should be put to death? And how can you say that I'm not taking a side? You know, I, I, think, that, I think we need to preach the gospel to them. I think they need to be saved. You know, didn't Jesus die for everyone? Well, I'll tell you, Jesus did die for everyone. But here's the thing. 
Look at what it says in verse number 13. It says, Now therefore deliver us the men, the children of who? The children of Belial. Okay, so the Bible says that these people are children of Belial. Okay, now what, 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 what did it say in chapter number 19? Back in chapter number 19, because so, you say, well, well, that's just the children of Israel saying that. That's not, you know, they just made that up. That's not really true. But what does the Bible say? Judges 19, look at verse number 22. It says, now, as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men in the city, certain sons of Belial, beset the house round about. Now, who said that? The narrator of the Bible. Now, the narrator is never wrong. Amen. Why? Because that is the Holy Spirit, okay, telling, you know, whoever wrote down the book of Judges, whoever that was, he told him, write this down. Yes. You are to tell the world that these people were sons of Belial, yes. Amen. that they were sons of the devil. And that, that's who Belial is in the Old Testament. Actually, interestingly enough, Belial was a word in the original text used to describe someone lawless or fornicating. It's believed to be a compound word of the Hebrew script for the words not and profitable or benefit, or when put together, not good or beneficial. It wasn't until later English versions that it became personified as Satan or Lucifer, so more accurately, the people described were lawless, not gay. Either way, you're talking about literal interpretations of a scripture that's been reinterpreted and translated over thousands of years. Even if you take the original scripture as fact, as the infallible word of God, is there not any room along the long road this book took through kingdoms, empires, rulers who sought to use it for control and oppression? Is there no room through all of that for interpretation and, dare I say, reflection and meditation? Apparently not. You know, you know why, why, are they, why are these parents, right, these super liberal parents that are just completely woke and they hate everything about God and they hate everything about the Bible, you know, why are they targeting... They're, they, why are they targeting children? Well, because, it, because children are the most vulnerable people, and children believe everything you tell them. Okay, they just, they just soak it up like a sponge. You know, you could tell them the sky is green, and they're going to believe it. Ironic that he would call out parents for teaching children virtues like acceptance, noting that children will believe anything you tell them, kind of like how they'll believe stories about incest, rape, murder, and dismemberment are good things because that's what you're telling them. Because if, if we're going to figure out what the Bible says, we need to use the Bible as a dictionary. We need, to, we need to use the Bible and compare Scripture with Scripture. Because, you know, we, we, sh we should never come to the Bible and take our definition of something and try to insert it onto the Bible. Yeah. That's, that's not how you figure out what the Bible is trying to say, okay? And here's the most clear breakdown of how they will twist the Bible to their own ends to do anything to justify their bloodlust and hate for people they don't understand and make no effort to. Okay, you know, and that's what happens a lot of times with these people, these, these, these liberals that think everything's fine, everything's okay, you know, there's no evil in the world, it's, it, 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 you know, unless you're a Christian, then you're evil. There's no evil in the world, nothing happens, and, you know, and, the, and they're just fine with their queer relative. And then they find out later that their queer relative, you know, has molested their, their child. Well, you know, you let your child hang around with a brute beast. You know, it's, 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 it's like that uh, several years ago there was that, you know, situation where like a, there was a zoo where the, the little baby like somehow got into the gorilla pen and the gorilla like had the baby. It's like, okay, well, you know, the gorilla had the baby for a little while, but if they just, if they just didn't do anything, if they just let it play out, who knows what could have happened. That gorilla, that gorilla could have easily just torn that little baby apart just in an instant. You know, and, and that's what it's like when these people, they want to they let their children hang around with these people. They want to take them to Drag Queen Story Hour, and they want to do all this stuff. It's, it's like the, you know, they're, they're putting their, their little baby in the gorilla pen. They're putting their little baby in the trained grizzly pen. They're putting their little baby in, in the trained tiger pen. Well, you, probably nothing will happen. But sometimes things do happen, though. In fact, a lot of times uh, things happen, okay? And so, you know, it, you know if, if, if there's a brute beast running around, you know, it needs to be taken care of. Why? Because it's a clear and present danger to society, okay? Jason continues in his own little world for a while like this. I wasn't even there, and I'm exhausted listening to it. 
The need these people have to feel persecuted, even as they call for literal governmental persecution and oppression of people they disagree with, disagree with, by the way, based on their interpretations of the Bible, not what it's literally saying, they have to cobble together meaning for these verses by pulling context away, by referencing scripture that was written decades or longer apart from each other. All for what? For this, to sit and tell children who they should grow up hating, who deserves among God's creation to be seen as less than human. You know, and I found this out very recently, you know, that, they, that these people are, cre they, you know, they, they creep in and they can put on a really tight mask. You know what? And they can even look like a Baptist. They can talk like a Baptist. They'll even smell like a Baptist. But it turns out that they are flaming sodomite. Then we get to this, and I can only imagine it was talking about me. I'm not surprised if they found out who I was. And given the timing of Jason's return to the church and what he references here, I'm almost sure this was me they're talking about. But I'm going to take this as a low point of pride that my act was so good, they thought I talked and even smelled like a Baptist. I was worried the scent of Lutheran potluck casserole would never come out. Jason continues his sermon, insisting that you either believe this interpretation of the doctrine wholeheartedly, or you're going to hell. After I finished watching this sermon, I didn't want to keep going with the project. Partially because of the multiple mentions now of me being a wolf among the sheep, I was very sure they had sniffed me out, but it didn't matter to me. I had found what I was looking for. I grew up in a church. I recognized so much of the ins and outs of this congregation, the rhythm of the Sunday routines, the fellowship they found visiting, laughing, and sharing time after church. But beneath this veneer of kindness was nothing but misery. These people inhabit a lonely world where nothing and nobody can be trusted, where everything is out to get them and everyone different deserves suffering and death. For all the warmth they greeted me with, behind that mask was nothing but cold, and I think deep down, they know this. And I hope they realize how wrong they are and correct it, if not for themselves, then for their children who don't deserve to grow up suffocated by their vicious ideology. To me, belief and faith can be wondrous things, but not without doubt, meditation and finding that meaning for yourself. This church has none of that. There's no room for doubt. There's no room for communication with God. Every issue can be chalked up to who will burn and who won't by consulting scripture that often bears only a passing resemblance to the questions the congregation may have. Yet it's delivered to them as inescapable truth. In reality, everyone here is being taught to use the Bible as an ideological justification for a political worldview. For a church that preaches all you need is God's word, so many things that are preached and taught can't be found in the Bible. From passing jokes referencing cat litter in schools to disproving conspiracies about laws and Jews running the world. These aren't based in any scripture, they're based online. They're the ideological underpinnings of a growing conspiratorial right-wing movement. And here we see it filtered down from screaming talking heads to mothers who want the best for their children so they turn to a voice they think they can trust behind a pulpit. And that's the real moral quandary here. These people, at least most of them, I don't think are evil. I don't think they should be shot for being Christian. I don't think they should be put in jail for believing differently than me. Yet they represent a growing and open threat to people like me. And even if they themselves don't take violent action, as we saw with Tyler Dinsmore, there are people out there who are looking for an excuse and encouragement to justify their violence. And when their pastors are praising the deaths of gay people as a good thing, Thin doublespeak saying they don't want Christians to go out and kill isn't enough. And in these things that aren't in the Bible, we see firsthand just how close extremist, violent doctrine is to the right-wing commentators like Matt Walsh, Tim Poole, Mark Dice, and others who hide behind conspiracies and laugh off every time a fan of theirs commits a mass shooting. The proximity of these arguments and the non-scripture beliefs of this church, which advocates for queer people to die, are nearly perfectly overlapped. If they ever see this video, or if their fans do, they may say, well, these people are extremists. You can't pin that on pundits who just read the news and give their opinions to millions of people. And like the beginning of the video, I have to ask, if all of these conservatives problems with society, with LGBTQ people, women, children, Jews, and everything else, if all of these problems and the problems of the church are the exact same, how do you think their solutions are going to be any different? Hey 
there, everyone. Thank you for staying until the end of the video. Uh, if you could, my, my channel has a bit of a monetization issue where I, all of my big videos that might bring people in and that get a lot of watch time are actually ineligible uh, due to either copyrights or uh, other things like music choices, violence, and or talking about trans people, talking about gay people. So if you could uh, help share this around and maybe consider giving a few dollars to my Patreon so you can be listed uh, here with all of these other amazing donors who help me survive and buy groceries and keep making weird experimental content like this. This was obviously a huge swing for me. Um, doing this was has been nerve wracking and getting it finished will be a massive weight off my chest. So I wanna give extra special thanks to my patrons who have been patient with me um, as I've kept this project under wraps and to everybody in my life who has helped me uh, with this and processing and going through it. I also just wanna say, that I hope everyone out there has a wonderful pride and that you are spending it with people you love and who love you because we are all alone in this together, like the song says, and we need to support each other in these hard times.